Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Harjeev Singh, and I uh, have the privilege of moderating a fantastic panel on uh, Indian brands going global uh, and how sort of that ties uh, into sustainability and the post-pandemic world. Uh, with me this afternoon, I have a, a, a set of panelists that bring a very diverse uh, round of perspectives. Uh, I have uh, Yasho Sabu, who's the CEO of KDDL. Uh, I also have with me Gary Becker, who's the Director of Sustainability at NextGen Packaging, uh, and uh, Siddhant Mota, who is with Dentons, which is uh, the largest law firm in the world. Uh, gentlemen, good afternoon, and uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, for uh, the audiences, what I thought was I would set the context for the panel a, a little bit and uh, weave in some of the threads that each of you will be talking about. The way we will do the panel is uh, I'll do a minute and a half, two minutes more of the introductions uh, in, in the setting of the context. And I'll invite uh, Gary, Yasho, and Siddhant in that order to share their perspectives for five to six minutes each. Uh, and then we can do a Q&A as uh, folks uh, come into the session. Uh, so without further ado, I think, uh, the topic we have is, is actually uh, a topic that we could go into multiple rabbit holes with, uh, but uh, I, I think there are several that we had discussed as a panel. And uh, really, at, at a very macro level globally, what we are seeing is brands are increasingly being called uh, out uh, to account on uh, by two key uh, stakeholders. One, of course, is their customers, and, and especially if you look at uh, the the growth of the demographics within the Gen Z, the millennials, uh, and how the impact of climate change uh, gets uh, increasingly picked up uh, across global narratives uh, and, and the uh, responsibility that comes with uh, consumption patterns that the world has uh, and how we change it to ensure that uh, the world is in a better place than it is today in terms of how we consume and, uh, and, and create sustainable brands. Uh, the other part is, of course, investors, uh, which uh, have increasingly uh, uh, got, come under a lot of pressure, particularly from uh, large uh, institutional uh, investors like pension funds, sovereign wealth funds. Uh, and, you know, they sit on $40 trillion of uh, investable capital globally, and they are also driving this. Uh, BlackRock, which is one of the largest institutional investors in the world, uh, last year, sort of uh, led by their CEO, Larry Fink, talks about how ESG, uh, the environmental, social, and governance elements of how they uh, look at companies to invest in, uh, is going to be increasingly important. Uh, and, and those are big, important trends. But at a micro firm level, uh, I think what we'll also talk about today are how Indian companies have sort of made a mark at, at a global level with their brands. Uh, are there opportunities uh, from a sustainability perspective within that? But also more importantly, what are Indian companies doing to sort of create a level playing field uh, at a global level? Uh, and so uh, without further ado, I'd uh, love to call Gary to kick this off, followed by Yasho and then Sid. Gary, over to you. Uh, thank you, Harjeev. I appreciate it. Uh, great to be on this, this distinguished panel with uh, people who are doing the hard work, um, moving uh, businesses towards sustainability and, um, and increasing uh, companies' branding opportunities. Uh, I think that COVID has really changed uh, the way consumers interact with companies. Um, and it's empowered a new generation of consumers who shop by their convictions. And like Harjeev was saying, um, it's they they're more discerning about brands that uh, are more sustainable. That's one of their convictions that they have. And um, it's important to have uh, a, a trust with companies that. Um, the company really is uh, truly sustainable. And I th this means a lot more than just painting walls green and hanging uh, posters of sunflowers up in retail stores. It's about building sustainability into a brand so that it becomes uh, a, a brand of trust as far as, as, um, as sustainability is concerned. And I think this is also a way for companies to um, 
make their brand stand out from others is using sustainability to do that. And that can be done in many different ways. That can be done with certification, uh, especially with companies that uh, produce their own uh, products. Uh, certification like ISO 14001 or 9001 or um, ROHS uh, certifications. These all help to uh, bring trust to the uh, sustainability of a company. Uh, I think that it's important, though, that it's done in stages. And uh, I was talking uh, earlier with uh, Yasho about it, where uh, it's something that just can't be done all of a sudden. It has to be done in stages. It has to be done in um, in, in ways that it's uh, it's it's uh, it's doable. And it's coming up with strategies to do that. And I think it's important to work with professionals in order to do that. Uh, because uh, really, when you look at sustainability, uh, a lot of things that you think are sustainable are really not. And professionals know how to bring sustainability into a company. So I think that uh, sustainability is one of the key ways that we have to really make a brand stand out and to uh, position themselves in a, uh, in a global position. Great. Thank you, uh, Gary. Uh, Yasha, uh, love to hear your thoughts about your journey and building uh, your company's brand, uh, particularly in, a, uh, in an industry that most people don't associate India with. And I think that, that to me, is the most fascinating part of uh, what you have been able to do with your company. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ajeev, and uh, great privilege to be on this, uh, on this panel. And uh, this is, of course, a, a, a very, uh, let's say, a topic that's close to me uh, because over the last 20 years, uh, we've really tried to establish selling our watch components made in India to uh, brands, to uh, high-end brands in, in Switzerland. And we started at a time when um, uh, India, let's say 25 years ago, businesses in India, especially small businesses, not only did they not sell anything abroad or create a brand abroad, they didn't even dare to or aspire to do that. And uh, so it has been a big change. And uh, what's, what's amazing over the last couple of years is that um, uh, this has changed a lot. The young, the young breed of professionals and entrepreneurs in India today aspire to go global. They are no longer content with just being limited to the Indian market. So aspiration has changed. Uh, I, I do believe that acceptability has changed as well. Acceptability of brands from all over the world in other countries. That's because, first of all, consumers are more diverse. Let's say if you are producing something with, with some Indian heritage or an Indian brand, you have millions of Indians overseas who are your natural customers. But not only that. I think a lot of non-Indian customers also understand uh, global cultures, accept global cultures, and they're willing to accept international brands. So the acceptability has grown a lot. And uh, third and most important, the ability to market and to establish uh, brands uh, across uh, the world in international markets, this has grown phenomenally. And uh, here especially is the whole issue of what happens with digitalization, something that's hugely accelerated with this COVID impact. You know, so, uh, I mean, there was a time when uh, being an Indian brand, it would be very difficult to establish internationally because you had the offline uh, major players and it would be extremely difficult to even get a toehold. But now with digital and e-commerce and digital marketing, the way you communicate, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, everybody can enter. And, uh, you know, if, if I have, a, I, I'll just explain uh, two very, very interesting examples. One from 20 years ago, again, in the watch business, everybody in India knows the brand Titan. And 25 years ago, when they established, they aspired to go international. And uh, it was a great uh, brand, great product, great communication, a huge hit in India. And they did everything by the book 
uh, to go international. They were in Paris, they were in the US, they were in Europe, everywhere, but they just couldn't get in because watch retailers abroad were just not keen to take on an Indian brand sitting next to very high-end international brands. Uh, today, the story is very different. You know, So you have uh, a brand like uh, Royal Enfield, which is making inroads. Another great example is the tea, a very small startup tea brand called Vadam. Uh, it started a couple of years back, and they're already uh, selling 70% of their produce in, in the U.S., Likewise, there's a there's an international uh, there's a shirts brand Andaman again very much rooted in India but global aspirations. All of this being possible because of this great uh, change which has happened in the last couple of years, accelerated by uh, by COVID. So I think there is uh, there is this great uh, there is this great potential for Indian brands and why only Indian brands you know brands from every country to establish themselves. And of course, sustainability is one huge 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 part of it. Because uh, I believe brands uh, need to be uh, seen and to be believed to be responsible. And sustainability is a huge part of it. But I, I rather feel that it's going to go even beyond sustainability. Right? So uh, the, the whole format of ESG, it cannot just be about audits and ticking off. That's a necessary condition. But in the end, the brand has to come across as a responsible and humane brand. Ten years ago, everybody spoke about size and technology. Today, everybody speaks about sensitivity and responsibility. So I think these are very, very key, important thoughts and words. Thank you, Yasho. Uh, Siddharth, uh, we'd love to get your perspective. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Rajiv. I, there's a lot I actually have to say, follow up on what Yasho has already uh, shared with us. So I just thought I would set the context by talking a little bit about what's happened over the last 15 years as well in terms of uh, the aspiration that Indian business uh, overall, uh, forget retail and consumer brands for a second, but large industrial companies, IT companies, pharmaceutical companies, even automotive companies, you know, they've had this aspiration to grow abroad. Initially, uh, the desire was, of course, uh, driven by this opportunistic um, belief that people had that, that growth would come from markets overseas. Uh, and of course, these were not really decisions that were based on uh, companies realizing that they wanted to build a brand for themselves globally, but more there was capital to be invested. Uh, there were interesting opportunities. So there wasn't really this driving force in people's mind that we, we do it based on the desire to build a brand for ourselves. But okay, we need to capture more of the global market. So in the automotive sector, you had... Uh, you know, companies like Tata Motors acquiring Jaguar Land Rover. You had uh, in the heavy industry, Mittal Steel merging with Arcelor. Uh, there, are, there are tons of examples like that. But, uh, you know, you have more recently Reliance Retail acquiring families. Uh, these, of course, uh, you know, these groups have really um, rested on the brand value of these brands to actually build their name overseas rather than working to create a specifically Indian brand. And of course, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because these are companies that, that are driven by uh, numbers, by decisions and a lot of strategic thinking. But in the proof, they have ended up creating a space for India on the global stage. So that's a really interesting phenomenon that's really come about in the last uh, 15 years. So even now, you know, in times of COVID, we have Indian brands recognized around the world. We have Serum Institute producing uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine for the world. We have, uh, we've had companies like uh, Sipla providing affordable uh, medication for diseases like cancer and AIDS in Africa for the last 20 years. We have, uh, you know, the Indian IT companies which are truly global. And even places like Scandinavia, the average a uh, software engineer uh, or the average sort of, you know, company servicing uh, large multinational clients happens to be Indian. Uh, so things have really changed in the last 15 to 20 years. Again, more recently, you have brands like uh, the uh, Oparo and Taj hotels that have properties not just in places like London and Dubai, that are global hubs, but also in countries like Morocco, Egypt, Indonesia. And they're targeting well beyond the uh, average Indian luxury traveler, but also looking to sort of grab a share of the market of luxury travel globally. So I think this is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, the other subject I, you know, that, that I sort of believe very strongly uh, is relevant here is the fact that Indian brands 
uh, shouldn't just be targeting developed markets. I know there's obviously a large conversation about how large uh, a market there is for certain consumer products or industrial products in the United States and Europe and Canada, Australia and so on. The, the more traditionally developed markets we think of, but, but I think India really needs to work a lot harder uh, to market its products in countries where the soft power of India and therefore the Indian brand resonates a lot more. Uh, whether it's the power of Bollywood, Ayurveda, Yoga, and of course the Indian diaspora that Yashro mentioned, in, uh, in, which is so strong in, in so many places well beyond the development. Uh, I think that's where the real growth is going to come from in the future. So we should really think how we can, we can develop our, our name and our brand there. I'll just give you a few examples from my own travels. We're in North Africa and countries like Algeria and Egypt. I've seen Mahindra SUVs being sort of the standard car driven in the Sahara Desert. You have Dhaka and Patanjali two places on shelves of almost every uh, chemist shop. You have um, uh, Mahindra tractors being used by farmers who plow their fields in Africa and in Southeast Asia. So, so, so it's, it's really interesting again what happened in the last 15 years. So, so we should really be focusing a great deal on these countries if we want to look at marketing our products to people beyond the Indian diaspora. Of course, in, in the UK, in London, you will find Indian brands, food products, so many other things. And in the, you know, because Indian brands are end up flying that ethnic flag uh, to target their products to the Indian communities. You will see products in shops in Wembley and South Hall in the suburbs of London, but very rarely do you see Indian products in the central or Harrods. Of course, you have occasional a pop-up that comes up selling Indian apparel or cosmetics, but, but we have a very long way to go to actually find ourselves um, on par with Western brands and in these very high end countries. Uh, so, so we have to sort of have a strategy where in developed countries we perhaps look at uh, you know products that are universally accepted and desired, and Indian brands really need to pivot towards producing everybody rather than that what feels just to Indians. And in developing markets like ASEAN, Central Asia, uh, North Africa, or the Middle East, or even Central and Eastern Europe, for that matter, where, like I said, India, you know, the, the, the idea of India resonates a lot more, we should probably look at uh, capitalizing on that and really seeing how we can uh, grab more eyeballs through, through that process. Sure. No, thank thank you for sharing that, Siddhant. I know we chatted about this, and uh, I'm glad in the audience we have Shruti from uh, Invest India because uh, one of the things I know you pointed out when we were discussing this was how can India create a, sort of a push as a as a government, right? And and the government usually stays away from uh, promoting the brand as such. You know, they help on a lot of other things uh, and, and sort of bringing investment into the country, but. How can it help in sort of promoting uh, externally? I know you have uh, shared some thoughts on that. Uh, do you want to maybe comment a little more on that? So was that addressed to me? Yeah, uh, to you, Oh yeah, I thought you were speaking to the audience. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we we have this issue in India again, where it's a mindset issue, both at the government level as well as the private sector level. I think. We need Indian agencies to really be promoting uh, our products on a very big scale. I think a, a, a very big issue that a lot of brands face is that they don't have the resources that multinationals have to market their products overseas, particularly in the Indian consumer goods brands. Of course, we're not talking about Dabur or ITC, but the average apparel or uh, retail uh, brand or, or watches like uh, like Yasho mentioned, so, so, so there, there are too many areas where, where we can do more of this. But, uh, we, we do have government organizations. I know the government has you know, trade boards promoting the export of Indian tea, Indian coffee, Indian Ayurvedic products. But we should look at the example of other countries. We, we really have um, uh, people doing a lot to promote their companies. I think Switzerland, which has been mentioned a few times, is a great example. I think it's just synonymous with. Uh, with luxury and you know whether it's watches, chocolate or cheese, these are these are things that are household names around the world. And people know the these middle classes around the world know about all these brands. You have a country like France where Business France helps market everything from a Rafale jet to 
uh, a larger area macaroon you have you, you know you have you have countries like switzerland where uh, sorry, uh, sweden where uh, you have uh, their business agencies back and huge companies like h&m and ikea and helping them go global and governments are willing to engage with government as well as private sector in other countries uh, to actually uh, promote their companies' interests overseas, and unfortunately, in India, in India, we don't really have that. A lot of the focus has been on inbound, uh, inbound investment, um, and there's this mindset that the government shouldn't really be promoting private sector players. You know, how, how do we promote one player above the other? We, you know, a very simple example is you go to an embassy event anywhere in the world, you attend a U.S. Fourth of July reception. Uh, all the food is sponsored by Starbucks and Pizza Hut and Domino's and all these other you know, McDonald's, all, all the big American names. And you know they have their stalls there, and everyone enjoys the food. It's popular, popularized to people who perhaps didn't know it earlier. We just don't have that in India because there's this government mindset where, and of course there are various historic reasons that that that, that, that stems from that, that we don't need to get into here, but. But we can't really be seen to be promoting private sector players. So that that's a mindset that needs to change. Then the consumer level, of course, in India, there's this mindset where even the wealthy Indians won't really consume Indian brands, which is which, which is very unfortunate. I think uh, there needs to be a lot more talk around that because the one percent in India prefers to go and do their shopping in London or Dubai or Milan or Paris. They won't really do it in, in, in India. So that's that, that that's something that needs to change. And I think until our own people embrace our brands more strongly, it's very difficult to create this global, you know, level playing field for them where you know, Indians in London are not using Indian brands. So that's that, that's a, a problematic uh, issue. Then on the government level, we also have this, uh, you know, make in India for the world uh, strategy where we want to develop ourselves into this big manufacturing hub. We, we want it to be uh, a, um, uh, a factory for the world, if you like. We're trying to replace China in some ways. Countries like Vietnam and Indonesia have benefited more in the post-COVID move of certain kinds of manufacturing away from China, even though we haven't. And I could go on and on about that. But, but you know, we, we produce the best gemstones in the world, yet we don't have globally known uh, jewelry brands. We, we end up supplying them to the, the French uh, jewelers and the Swiss watch manufacturers. We, we produce our best quality food products in the world, yet we don't have globally recognized brands in that, in that space, despite the fact that Indian food in itself is such a huge brand that you know, every South Asian, whether it's a Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Sri Lankan, or Nepalese uh, in Europe runs an Indian restaurant yeah. and we serve Indian food. So, so you know, we, yet we haven't really been able to create global brands in the food, food processing space. So, so there's, there's a lot. And of course, if, if it doesn't come from, from government, then, then the private sector has to get its act together and you have to have sort of more private sector private sector partnership. And I think in the short term, that's really going to be more interesting in, in how things are, are really going to move forward. There's also this bias against India in, in the Western media for, for various reasons, which is, which, is, which is prevented. And I think there the sustainability issue comes into play a lot because, of course, we have historically had issues with there being concerns around pollution, child labor, working conditions in factories, federal human rights situations stemming from politics. So, so there's, there, there, there's a lot that, that, that has to be said about all these things. And therefore, there's this general bias in the Indian media where, where people like to see India as a country of snake charmers and sort of, you know, cows roaming the streets rather than all the development we've actually achieved since independence, especially in the last 20 years. So, so, so there's a lot that the government needs to do to, to, to address that. And, and of course, that's really an endless subject. And I'm sorry I'm hogging the mic here but, but just 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 one last point i wanted to make again government uh, backing may not be sufficient i i i spoke about switzerland and france but but look at other countries in the very obvious one being china uh, where again despite how much backing from the state and its institutions goes into promotion of business they haven't really been able to create global branded products either so 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 the, so there's the, that that's also something that's worth thinking about Great. Now, thank you, Siddhant. I, I know you covered a bunch of stuff. I'll try and sort of wrap that up towards the end. Uh, but I just want to bring in Gary and, and, and a little sort of more perspective because uh, I know uh, part of what we also are discussing is sort of what's happening on the sustainability side. Uh, Gary, could you share some of your thoughts on, on what you're seeing 
uh, as trends that could potentially benefit Indian brands also if sustainability could be weaved in. I know uh, you uh, have done work in India as well uh, from your perspective. And what are you seeing uh, at the sort of uh, level from a European and an American, a North American perspective? And, and where well, do you think opportunities may be for Indian brands uh, to leverage some of the sustainability part of it? Yes, uh, Sudan is talking about, um, you know, the government coming in and, and um, influencing the market. Um, we, we at, at Ditto, uh, we tend to, um, and, and with NextGen Packaging now, which I'm involved with, uh, we're an international company and we deal with companies all over the world. And um, what we're seeing in Europe is uh, a lot of influence on the government, uh, which is changing the way uh, businesses work, the kind of uh, sustainability requirements that they they demand, and and they um, they have laws for uh, against single use plastics, and that's uh, really changing the uh, the playing field in Europe. But it's 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 going over into other countries as well. We're seeing it in the United States, and. Um, in China, in India, um, and and the thing is, it's just it's just smart business at this point, and uh, it's it's going to have to be a part of every company's business plan going forward. Uh, having a sustainability, having having a a trustworthy sustainability program, is going to be really critical for any company going forward, and. Uh, I'm seeing that in, in India, we deal with a lot of uh, factories and services out of India, and uh, we see great uh, certification going on there. Uh, that's a, a part of, um, of doing business there, uh, that we, we don't have to um, ask for uh, different kinds of certifications because they already have it. Uh, we're seeing that with materials as well, is that... Um, uh, there's a larger focus on making sure that all materials that are used in processes are 100% sustainability uh, certified. Uh, we work primarily in paper, and uh, so F FSC is becoming the standard even for recycled paper. Uh, so I, I see I see a global movement with this, which is what I find very uh, encouraging. And it's not because of government coming in and saying you have to do something. It's because the consumer is saying it. Uh, they're saying it with their purse. Uh, they're, uh, they're influencing companies in ways that I haven't seen before. An example of this is we were working with a major uh, American children's clothing company. And uh, we we're talking about bringing sustainability into their company more. And they said, you know, we think it's really interesting and important, but we're not going to do it until our consumer tells us to do it. And this is old thinking. And this is a very old company as well. And the fact is that um, we companies have to be more proactive and they have to start thinking more about um, uh, how they compete in the open marketplace and I don't, you know, any country around the world, uh, the, the businesses that work there have to be thinking about this as a ma major aspect of, of how they do business. Now, thank, thank you, Gary. You hit on a very important point, which I think is very important uh, for companies that want to build global brands. You talked about certifications and how those are important. Uh, in my own experience, one of the things I've seen, uh, particularly with the sector that I worked very closely over the last 20 years, was building sort of the brand for the Indian technology industry, particularly on the services side. Uh, and one of the things the tech uh, industry did, uh, this is sort of for the Y2K piece, was uh, piggyback of uh, the Carnegie Mellon CMM one, two, three, four, five certifications that uh, that allowed them to initially crack that market, right? I mean, uh, the the growth in that industry has been so phenomenal. Uh, oftentimes, even in India, a lot of people don't realize that in 2004, three and four, the entire Indian IT industry of you know the TCS, Wipro, HCL names that are well known within at least the B two B space uh, at a European at at a American boardroom level were all of them 
combined less than $8 billion in total mm -hmm. revenue. Today, mm -hmm. that's a $200 billion industry and continues to grow at like 15, 20 percent. Uh, and, and they were really, I think, their biggest brand calling card for their brands used to be the certifications. Uh, and on that note, I wanted to sort of ask Yasho because he's also gone into an industry which, uh, you know, it's, it's high precision uh, in terms of the work that you do. How has that journey changed for you over the last two decades and, and sort of what were some of the things that you as a company uh, did uh, to be able to kind of meet those uh, sort of standards? Uh, you know, um, so uh, let's say two decades ago, your calling card was quality. And uh, nobody believed that India could get quality products appropriate for Swiss watch standards. That took some time to establish. Today, you can't speak about quality. Nobody wants to, to talk about it because it's taken for given. It has to be. Mm -hmm. There used to be response time. There used to be that you would deliver on time and so on. It's all passing. You have to do that or you're out. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, certifications, of course, is extremely important. We've seen over the last seven or ten years, more and more of the brands we work with uh, they do come, they have their audits, you've got to get yourself certified, uh, you know, everything containing uh, concerning environment, governance, uh, social responsibility, and so on. So all of that has happened. But uh, <clears throat> I think two or three things have never really gone away. In fact, they've become more and more uh, important. Number one, <clears throat> who are you and what do you stand for? And typically, this is very important on consumer products, but it's also important on B2B industrial products. Who do you stand for? What are you really good at? What do you really believe in? And is that something that is reflected across the organization? Okay. The, the second thing is that how are you different from the others? Now, this could, of course, be price, but we're not in that market. Right? If you're working with luxury brands, price comes last of all. So whether your product is something distinctive, whether the way you serve customers is something dis distinctive, whether you're more innovative, whether you're more flexible on quantities and so on, that becomes extremely important, more and more important. And why? Because products are becoming more and more personalized, even with very large groups. Gone are the days when you make series of hundreds and thousands of one product. Every market needs to, needs to be adapted for consumers need to be adapted for. And at the very high end, you're now talking about a single piece being customized for specific people, right? So, you know, in the watch industry, for example, these bespoke models or limited edition models are the ones that, you know, most collectors are going for. Um, <clears throat> coming back to sustainability, as I mentioned, I think we are seeing much more uh, uh, sustainability as a key issue. But even going beyond coming to issues of, you know, are you responsible as human beings? Are you responsible? I'm going to give, uh, you know, uh, just one or two examples, recent examples from our business. Uh, last year in the middle of COVID, we decided to launch what we call the Million Tree Project. Over the next 10 years, we're going to launch uh, to plant a million trees. And this was, you know, we chose as the area, the, the Kaveri Basin, where two of our factories are based in Bangalore. And I visited the area as a kid many times, and it is completely devastated. So we started to work with, and I just made a very, very amateurish handheld video of what I wanted to do and what our company was committing themselves for. It has been the single most important piece of communication when I got responses from our customers, even friends who were not customers, customers we were chasing for years, not that they became our customers, but at least they noticed us. And this is not because it was a slick production, but because the message, I think, was right. anything, you know. And uh, the second little example that I want to give, and that's about how important it is to show how human you are. Who are the humans in your company, right? Uh, we did a little experiment on, um, uh, we package our product, watch dials, and we send it to our customers, right? So we put in each... Uh, uh, packet of dials, a box of dials, a little thing saying these dials were finally inspected and okayed by such and such person. And there was a little QR code where they could scan 
And when they scan that, you would have a 15 second message from this staff worker, whatever, saying, look, I've been working here and it's a pleasure for me to inspect these dials and certify these dials for this customer. We are very proud to work for you. Something like that, right? And that was a great response because suddenly the inspectors in the Swiss factory, you open the thing, they're able to put a face to the brand name and they say, oh, okay, here is the guy who inspected these dials and he is willing to put his name and his mouth behind what he's doing. And this is a small thing, but it has taught us a lot of lessons. And I feel this, uh, you know, sustainability, responsibility, being human is an extremely important part of establishing global brands. Yeah, and well, I think it's, something. It's, it's, it's something Sorry, too... Go ahead. It's something, too, where in the 80s and 90s, it was all about, you know, power and bigness and, and technology. And we've gone to a point now where it's, it's bringing it down to a, a much, much more personal level. And people want to think about the companies that make products or services that they buy as being um, more human, about caring about the things that they care about. So uh, that's uh, those are great examples of of how to do that and to bring it down to a personal level, and it really ends up changing uh, one's brand and and the perception of one's brand. So so great, right? And I I think uh, what it also does is it uh, also makes uh, to me I think the most important point, Yasha, that you make is it makes the brand be more human. It has a soul. It has something that people can connect with rather than just corporate messaging that they do not have a feel or a connect to. And I think that's such a, a fantastic part of what you're doing, particularly with the uh, QR codes and, and telling that story of the folks who are actually doing this. Uh, Siddhant, just back to you. Uh, from your own experience, I know you sort of helped a lot of uh, Indian companies that are also uh, looking at going global. What are some of the companies that you are seeing that we may not have seen or heard of, right? And, uh, you know, what are some of these brands and what may they be doing that, that uh, others could learn from? You're on mute, uh, Siddhant. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, no, as I was just saying, uh, typically as a, as a large uh, law firm our size, we end up working predominantly with large corporates. Uh, so, 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 you know, and a couple of the companies I mentioned before are the kinds of people that we, we do work for. Uh, but, but generally, in terms of sectors, I think we will definitely see a lot more movement going forward. But until COVID, I would, have, I would have said there would be a lot more movement in the hospitality and FNB uh, sector potentially because we, you know, we were talking to a few brands from India that were looking at opening um, uh, branches overseas or looking at franchising overseas. But the last year and a half has really changed that. I think the franchise model would be something that, that, that would be very interesting for Indian brands in the future in that particular space because it's something hitherto almost sort of unknown to a lot of Indian companies and those that don't really have the resources to grow overseas themselves, you know, the medium to small uh, sized companies, but do have products that again uh, are a very good fit uh, for markets overseas. I, I, I would really see that an interesting uh, area. Uh, for them to grow higher. So, so within our law firm, what we've created is a uh, global retail and franchising consultancy, which has a lot of strategic advisory work well beyond uh, uh, the, the legal uh, framework as such and you know, the, the, the basic contracts and negotiations. So that's something very interesting. And there we have, uh, we've actually had a couple of conversations with, with some brands that that unfortunately are not Indian companies, but founded by non-resident Indians, either in London or Dubai, but, but still leveraging uh, the brand value of India. For instance, there's one doing very interesting uh, cosmetics and hair products, and they've managed to find themselves in, in a number of high-end stores in Europe. Uh, and, and they're telling the story of, uh, you know, how Indian mythology and Indian fables uh, sort of uh, give us all this knowledge about Ayurveda and, and you know, they, so it's, it's, it's a very interesting, quirky brand to watch out for. Uh, there, there, there are several stories like that, that 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 are very interesting. Unfortunately, I have to say that, that is coming more from Indians who are not living in India. So that, 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 that that's a bit of a uh, an, an interesting sort of phenomenon as well. Uh, but I'm sure we will be seeing more and more 
coming out of India, of course, as you, as you know very well, the inbound investment into the sector in India has been huge. You know, from companies like uh, Estee Lauder Group own a huge chunk of Forest Essentials, for example. You have you have you have lots of such examples because everyone wants to be a part of that that India story. And and then of course you get into the gray area of whether uh, the strategy behind the growth of this Indian brand will then be an Indian led strategy or not and, and, and what the focus areas for them will be. But I think we'll have to wait and see how, how post the pandemic consumer brands and retail brands from India are able to, uh, to sort of you know re- rebuild and, and how they are because at the moment a lot of people are very busy getting their house in order at home uh, as, as you can well imagine. So, so new markets and investing in in, in market exercises, something that everyone can can look at at this moment. And I, like I was saying before, a lot of the Indian brands, particularly in in apparel and retail, do not do not have the resources. They are not a Zara or an or an H and M. So, so it, that 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 will be an interesting uh, interesting thing to see. Of course, Indian companies have also been very used to to making a lot of money uh, in, uh, through manufacturing that's outsourced to them. So particularly again in those apparel uh, and cosmetic areas, for example, you have you have companies manufacturing factories manufacturing for uh, Polo and Florin, etc. So so it, I, I think the next ten years will be very interesting to see how how we actually manage to, to get out of that. And and, and, and to be honest, it's, it's, I think it's too soon to say what kind of impact uh, COVID will have on that uh, going forward. And then of course sustainability will will come into play in a very big way because. Everyone will be trying to rebuild themselves in, 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 in the year to come, and, and that will be a very important box that a lot of potential business partners as well as customers would want to take. Thank, thank you, Siddharth. Uh, we have uh, a few more minutes to go. I was just wondering if anybody in the audience would like to ask any questions of any of the panelists. Uh, then I can sort of open up the mic for you. Yes, uh, not. Uh, so we're, we're, as I said, only a couple of minutes to go before this session ends. Uh, what I thought I'd do is just quickly sort of pick up from all of the elements of uh, what all of you had said, just uh, sort of uh, wrap this up. Uh, one is I know, uh, you know, Indian brands uh, have a clear sort of opportunity with uh, post pandemic with the whole digitalization, right? And that is something Yasha, you had shared uh, of how uh, you're you're sort of seeing a lot of circumventing of traditional distribution channels and, and why that uh, is going to change the way Indian brands go global. Uh, Sedan, from your perspective, you're seeing uh, a, a lot of opportunity, particularly in places like Africa uh, and, and sort of in the Middle East and of course in, in Asia as well for Indian brands, which traditionally thought of going to Europe and the US and, and uh, opportunities with sort of, you know, potentially franchises and how uh, even NRIs are tapping into the Indian sort of brand value to, to do that. Uh, and Gary, uh, your perspective on sort of how uh, sustainability weaves into the conversation, not just for Indian brands, but brands everywhere right now, uh, you know, being more focused around uh, sort of humanizing brand and uh, you compared uh, sort of how the 80s was about being big and being powerful. Today, it's about really, you know, how are you sustainable as a brand? And I think uh, those are some big, broad themes, and I, I think we covered a lot of ground here today. And uh, thank you uh, all for being such a great uh, group of panelists. And uh, of course, I know we had audience going in and out. So, uh, but uh, I really enjoyed the discussion. I enjoyed learning from each of you. And uh, Gary, I hope you have a, a good night's rest because I know it's like so early in the morning for you. <laughs> And, uh, I'll, I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have one more win- minute to go. If in, any uh, anybody else has like a last comment to make, uh, Yasho or uh, no, I just want to say uh, thanks to everybody and good night to Gary. <laughs> <laughs> and Harjeev, thank you very much for your uh, your hosting this panel, and uh, really enjoyed uh, hearing everybody and. Um, it's it's great to be talking with people who are are doing the good work. So uh, thanks a lot. 
thank you. Yeah. Say, say, uh, Ajit, thank you. Thank you so much for 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 bringing this together and and really putting all the threads together so so interestingly. And thank you very much, Yashu and and, and Gary for the wonderful insights. Thanks, Adan. Thanks, Ajit. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you all.